Let us stand as we welcome the gospel. Which comes to us today from John chapter 3. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. So I had the great fortune of growing up in a community where just about everybody I knew was a church-going, faithful type of person. My family all went to church. I went to church with grandparents and aunts and my parents and my brothers tagged along too, of course. Yeah, I had to go. My other set of grandparents went to another church across the town. They were good Baptists, and extended family and friends, they all went to church. And one of the neat things for me was I didn't discover the stories of the Bible just with my Bible locked away in my room. Instead, I got to be presented with the stories through my loved ones around me each one sort of sharing a story they loved or cared about. And so when I read stories in Scripture, I think about the loved ones that shared that story with me. I can still vividly remember my grandmother reading to me stories out of my children's story Bible, and I still have that story Bible in my office every once in a while. Sometimes it actually makes more sense than the adult Bible I'm supposed to be using now. Anybody else use a picture Bible every once in a while? Yeah, Christopher does. Yeah. When I read this John text from chapter 3, one I imagine you've all probably heard before, I think about my grandfather, Max, for whom our son, Maxton, is named. Now, my grandfather, Max, was a good Baptist, a Baptist deacon, so he kind of knew his stuff. And one of his favorite questions he loved to ask people is, I want you to recite for me one verse in John chapter 3 that is not verse 16. Because we all know chapter 16, or verse 16, right? I mean, if you've been to a football game or anything like that, you've probably seen a sign with John 3.16 on it. I'm always just curious, like, what's your end game there with the sign? I mean, are you, what are you expecting someone's going to do? Like, oh, okay, I'll sign up. I mean, What he was really after, though, was to get deeper into the passage than just the easily quotable, for God's love the world passage. And I'm not knocking that. We're going to talk about that today, in fact. He wants you to understand the context in which this most beloved verse of Scripture comes so that you can really fully appreciate its meaning. And so John 3.16 comes in the third chapter of John, what I oftentimes refer to as the Nick at Night story. May re remember Nick at Night? Yeah. You got Nicodemus, otherwise known as Nick, showing up at night to have a conversation with Jesus. Now, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and in a lot of ways, we're a lot like Pharisees. Did you know that? 
Yeah, we're a lot like Pharisees. And what Pharisees liked to do was Pharisees liked to figure out what box you went in. Are you a good person or are you a bad person? Are you one of us or are you one of them? Are you right or are you wrong? And we do that also, don't we? I mean, we do that all the time. We're really good at categorizing where people are. Have you notice a lot of us always put ourselves in the, in, the, in, in the good box? Like, I'm definitely good. And the rest of you people, well, yeah, jury's still out right now. So Nicodemus is coming to Jesus, trying to get Jesus to affirm what he already thinks. And that's another thing we do. Do you ever notice that sometimes we go into things trying to have our own opinion and viewpoint affirmed? I mean, when you read something online, you want it to, to tell you what you already think, right? When you watch something uh, on the, the, the news, you're watching news that tells you what you already think, right? Am I touching on some toes there? Just, just pull them back a little bit, okay? Sometimes when we come to church, we come to church for the express purpose of having Jesus tell us what we already think. Now, is that how it works? Do we impose on Jesus what we think, or do we open ourselves to hear what it is that Jesus thinks? I'll let you ruminate with that one a little bit. So Nicodemus has shown up, and he wants Jesus to affirm what he already thinks. That he and all the Pharisees are the good people, and all the others, well, they're out of luck. The problem is, Jesus isn't going to do that. And this is where I want to drill down on that most famous, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son, Jesus. The word I want to focus on with you today is the world. See, in scripture, oftentimes, the world is code language for everything that is supposedly outside of the realm of God. Everything that's bad, that's sinful, that's problematic. It's the world and the worldly ways, which you've probably heard this before in church before, right? Be careful of the world and the temptations of the world and don't be too worldly. We use it the same way the Bible uses it. And so it's interesting that Jesus doesn't say there, for God so loved the good people that God sent his only son. Jesus doesn't say, for God so loved the beautiful people, so Jonathan's good and everybody else is out of luck. I'm glad you laughed at that and noticed that was a joke. For God so loved the rich people that God sent his only son. It doesn't say any of that. It says, for God so loved the world. And what we're talking about here is all the scary, bad, dangerous, unnerving stuff out there. Everything that you can imagine is what God loves. Now, I want you to hear something very clearly right now. God loves you, and God sent Jesus for you. So who does God love? Very good. Now, I want you to think about the person or people you dislike the most. And don't sit here and drink, I don't like dislike anybody. Come on, you got somebody. Everybody's got somebody. Think of who that is, and guess what? God loves them, too. God loves the entirety of all of creation, everyone and everything in it. That's why that verse reads, for God so loved the world. Here's the other thing I really love about Jesus, and particularly Jesus in this passage. Jesus came here to be with us, to experience all of life with us. And we see this happening throughout the Gospels, where Jesus is engaging in all the things that we would engage in. Eating a meal, celebrating with friends, going to a wedding, going to a funeral, just all kinds of things. Jesus also came to suffer and die. 
and ultimately go to the place of death. What I find fascinating about that is that means that there is nowhere where Jesus and his love for you are not found. Even in the most horrible, terrible, awful things that you can imagine, those dark places at night that make you toss and turn and wish you could go crawl in bed with mom and dad. Absolutely. (laughs) In every place, even in the place of death, Jesus is there with you, and his love for you does not end. For God so loved the world. That's you, and that's everything else. Amen.